Hello and welcome. We're live at the National World War II, National World War II Museum in New Orleans. It's uh, Ask a Curator Day and we are in the vault and I'd like to introduce our curator for this sequence, uh, Larry DeCures. Larry, thanks for doing this and um, um, uh, tell us about this particular collection and what your interest, uh, what's interesting about it. Well, these are flight jackets used by aviators in World War II. Um, the majority of them that you're going to see today are A2 flight jackets, which was uh, developed in the early 1930s as a summer weight flight jacket for air crews. Um, due to uh, the, the aircraft of the era, which were usually open cockpit. Um, so the reason behind these leather garments was at that time, Leather was one of the few wind and water resistant materials that was available. Uh, also, an uh, interesting note with the A2 flight jacket is it's one of the first garments ever made with a zipper. Um, now this first one I'm going to show you here belonged to a crewman aboard a B-24. That was part of a clandestine unit called the Carpetbaggers. Now their job was to drop OSS operational teams in the occupied France, SOE agents, strategic uh, operations executive, the British version of the OSS, so to speak. Um, so the bombs painted on the jackets usually represented, represented combat missions uh, the parachutes here or our uh, resupply drops or uh, OSS team insertions. And the wings he has here are aerial gunner wings. You can tell by the little winged bullet on his jacket. Now, um, I have a quick question. Yeah. These are issued, right? These are uniform issued. These are issued items. Now, um, by 1943, they quit issuing. The A2 leather jacket in favor of cloth shell jackets like these. Now this is a big leap, I guess, in textile technology at that time. So now you have uh, synthetic fibers that are water resistant and wind resistant. And then, unlike leather, when it gets cold, it becomes stiff and limit, limits your, your movement. Uh, these jackets, they stayed pliable in cold weather. So this particular example is called a B-10. They were much more functional, but, but airmen, they, uh, the A-2 leather was, was the favorite, no doubt. Um, and I have to ask, the jackets were important because the aircraft weren't, there was no climate control to speak of at all, right? Some of them had primitive heating mm -hmm. uh, in the cockpits and things like that. But, but as I was saying earlier, these are summer weight flight jackets, so they're not going to do you much good in Europe. Uh, but guys tended to tended to wear them anyway, and what they became more or less is uh, kind of like a status symbol, you know. Uh, and then guys would use these as a canvas, self-expression in a lot of ways. So this this is a from a a uh, co-pilot. Aboard a B-17, he flies 35 missions as a 17 co-pilot, and these bombs represent his 35 missions. And then he volunteers for another tour with fighters, and he flies P-51 Mustangs after that in Europe until the war ends. And he was the, the Tampa Kid? Is that That's his nickname, yeah, Tampa Kid. He Shout out from, to Tampa from Noel. What's that? Shout out to Tampa. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, So, once the war started, they only produced about a million more of these jackets, and guys were clamoring to get them. In 1943, they were declared limited standards. So what that meant is if you had, you are originally issued one of these, and it was damaged, you could request or requisition a, a replacement. Now people, airmen coming into the service and receiving their flight jacket 
or being issued their flight jacket for the first time, they got these after 1943. This, as I was saying earlier, a B-10. And then there was a, a model that replaced that later on called a B-15. So they keep advancing rather rapidly throughout the war. We had a quick, quick question from Facebook. Does, do we have any um, jackets in our collection or uniforms for um, female aviators? Um, maybe not here with us today, but do we? Do you know if we have any in our collection? We do have uh, a uh, garment from a Navy flight nurse, but no A2 leather jacket. They would have, like WASP, they would have used what the men use. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of uh, archival photos of, of, of WASP wearing the A2, the same one that the, the men wore. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So, just go through what I have pulled here. So, okay. the first ones I'm showing you here, or what I've shown you so far, are from the European Theater of Operations. You can see the, the ghost of uh, mm -hmm. the artwork on the back of this one. Another B-17 crewman. Now, uh, this is the one we saw a little earlier, but there's a big map on the back of his. That's amazing. Wow. Now, you can almost tell where these airmen serve just by the, the way these, these jackets are personalized. Like in the CBI, the China Burma India Theater, you see a lot of this uh, leather composition patchwork here where they take little pieces of leather and cut them out in the shape that they need and then just sew them on there. And that's, and that's all done by, by local craftsmen. And on the back of this jacket here, this is what's known as a bloodshed, which they usually say something to the effect, uh, I'm an American aviator here trying to, uh, you know, fighting the Japanese, so shelter me, get me back to mm -hmm. U.S. lines, things like that. Mm -hmm. and I have several jackets from the CBI. This is from a unit called the Burma Bridge Busters. This is what our B-25 in the Boeing Center is, is painted up to represent that unit. Mm -hmm. Another, another piece from the China Burma India Theater. And that's leather. That's, that's leather, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this is the China Burma India command patch mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a jacket from the Pacific Theater. Now, this belonged to a P 38 pilot who was actually a 11 Victory Ace. Mm. Another jacket from the Pacific Theater of a P-51 pilot. And that's his aircraft that's on the, the back. Mm -hmm. Peggy. Now I do have an example of a, a naval aviator's jacket. Now these were called 422As, and these were these had like a, a bi swing back here. You see how the A2 is like a single panel on the back. Mm -hmm. which kind of limits your, your range of movement. Mm -hmm. The Navy jacket was roomier and allowed you to... I mean, if you're a fighter pilot, you're constantly turning your head. That's why they wore scarves, so their necks wouldn't chafe. But, as I was saying, this is an example of a 422A, which was issued to Naval and Marine Corps aviators. Now, this particular 422A belonged to a member of a dive bomber squadron on Guadalcanal and he was part of the Cactus Air Force here which was the you know the collection of sure. uh, aircraft on Guadalcanal in the early days of the campaign. And we're right in the 75th anniversary cycle for Guadalcanal right, right now and I've been reading about the Cactus Air Force. Yeah so it's a very rare patch I don't even know how many in existence but there are not many. How, how do you come about knowing the the story of the, the men who had these jackets? Is it from, just learned from 
whoever's done the donation from a son or a daughter, oral histories, is all those different kinds of ways, right? Well, in the, I guess, best case scenario, it does come all wrapped up in a nice package like that. But in many cases, we have to do some research. And, you know, the thing with air crews is records were, were meticulously kept. There's missing air crew reports of anybody who was shot down or any aircraft lost. And especially with the pilots of uh, heavy bombers, B-24 pilots or B-17 pilots, the crew was named after the pilot's last name. So if this guy's Frank James, uh, it would be the James crew. So that it's easy to find information, especially for, for aircraft commanders. So in many cases, that's what we've had to do with some of these jackets. And, then, and in a lot of cases, we can't find any information on them. But uh, I think the flight jackets represent, I guess, the, the largest portion of our combat-worn uniform collection. Mm -hmm. So if you, were, if you were a ground pounder, um, you had to live in the mud. Your, your uniform was filthy. And it was usually tossed, mm -hmm. tossed away, thrown away. These guys, um, I mean, they, they, they faced all the same horrific elements that, a, that a, a, a combat soldier on the ground would have faced. But in many cases, they were going to a, a base in England and sleeping in a warm, dry bunk at night. Uh, but that's not the case for every airman, uh, especially in the Pacific or, or the CBI. But they were able to hang on to their stuff uh, a little easier. Another quick Facebook question. Is, is there a particular kind of leather that these... Oh, yes, yes. So the A2s here are made of horsehide. So these are horsehide. And they, they initially came, well, they only came in two colors. One was a russet brown, sort of like this. And then you see other contracts that come in the seal brown color here. Now, in many cases, once this lighter russet brown color was scuffed up, and, and, and just kind of worn out, they would re-dye on this dark seal brown color to hide all the scuffs. Um, and the navy jackets are goat hide, hmm. which tends to be a little stronger. Mm -hmm. And I do have a German flight jacket here. Now this is a German flight jacket. It's this would be a high altitude winter grade flight jacket here. But it's uh, shearing, as you can see on the inside here. Still in really, really good shape. I yeah, this, this one's in really, really nice condition. But that's just a small portion of our collection. We have, I mean, this is by no means the. Uh, all the types of flight jackets that were used. Uh, We've got quite a few on display out we do. In, in the exhibits. We do. Um, and, and, but this is a real treat to get backstage in, in the vault and see this uh, part of the collection. What kind of up, one last question and then I'll let you go. What kind of upkeep is there or are there storage uh, protocols that you use to, to maintain these in such excellent shape? Well, we, we, we store them flat in boxes mm -hmm. and then we kind of stuff them to keep their shape so no uh, creases develop in the leather. So we don't store them like this. We'll put them back in boxes and lay them flat. Now, we don't do much conservation work here on site. If anything needs uh, you know, repair, we'll, we'll send out to a professional conservator. And one last Facebook question. You, do you ever find anything in the pockets, either old maps or coins or trinkets, or have they pretty much been... I mean, sometimes maybe just by accident or kismet, uh, yeah. sometimes, ever? Uh, I have found, uh, like, a spare patch in a pocket from mm -hmm. time to time. And we do have a, a, a jacket from a Mustang Ace from 354th Fighter Group who uh, kept his uh, lucky uh, ring from his chute that he bailed out his plane with. That was in one of the pockets. But uh, I think he knew it was there. We, we knew it was there before we got it, so... Cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, happy Ask a Curator Day. We'll be back at noon in U.S. Freedom with Tom Chikansky, um, looking at one of our great macro artifacts. And Larry, thanks again. All right, Dave. Thanks.